Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Edith Jones. Uh, Dean Reuters said many of you would know who I am. I will just say that on June 1st of this year, I will celebrate my 36th anniversary as a judge on the Court of Appeals of the Fifth Circuit. Uh, every minute has been a joy so far, but this is my debut on uh, uh, TV, so to speak. So I hope you will bear with me <laughs> as I moderate this very distinguished panel. I note first, uh, Federalist Society reminds me we have some very important housekeeping items. Uh, this is a CLE event, and at an appropriate time, I will inform you of the passcode for the CLE. It will also signal on your screen so that you all have the opportunity to sign in. And um, be sure that you have signed in on the proper sheet and sign out for the day when you leave. Um, let's see. You will also need to complete an electronic certificate of attendance and follow all of the CLE instruction steps in order to receive credit. Sounds like a vaccine passport, doesn't it? If you are in the audience here, you may send us questions through a Q&A tab on your screen in the upper right-hand corner. There's also a chat tab for attendees to chat with each other. Uh, please do not use the chat tab to ask questions. Finally, uh, we will have a live Q&A session later on in the program. Uh, if you press the raise hands button and um, when we get to the Q&A session, we will, I will begin to address the questions that have been asked uh, in written form. With that, I will introduce our panel, uh, the topic of which is uh, uh, the religious liberty in the executive branch in this coming administration. As we know, presidential administrations have acknowledged the important role of religious institutions and pursued executive actions uh, to enforce religious liberty. The Trump administration was perhaps one of the most active in protecting certain religious liberty rights uh, in our modern day history. But the Biden administration has also acknowledged the important role of faith-based uh, partnerships and launched a White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships in February. This panel will explore the approaches to religious liberty and executive action that the current and uh, previous administration have taken, highlighting commonalities and differences. Our first speaker will be Mr. Roger Severino, a, se a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, where he directs its HHS accountability project. Before that, he was the longest serving director of the Office for Civil Rights in the uh, Department of HHS. He led a team of 250 staff enforcing the nation's civil rights, conscience, and religious freedom and health information privacy laws. Before that, he was the director of the DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society at the Heritage Foundation. He was with the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty and is a former DOJ trial attorney. Daniel Mack. Daniel Mack is an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law School, focusing on constitutional law and religious liberty, but his full-time job is that of director of the ACLU program on freedom of religion and belief. He leads a wide variety of religious liberty lit litigation, advocacy, and public education efforts nationwide and writes teaches and speaks on religious freedom issues. Uh, before working at the ACLU, he was a partner at Jenner and Block, specializing in First Amendment law. Our third speaker is Greg Lipper, a partner at Clinton and Peed, 
who litigates both trials and appeals. He has extensive experience in a very wide variety of uh, litigation and appellate work uh, uh, for a diverse set of clients, including financial institutions, media and technology companies, small businesses, nonprofits, and individuals. Previously, he spent over five years as the senior litigation counsel at Americans United for Separation of Church and State. He represented plaintiffs in a class action challenge to Alabama's ban on same-sex marriage and uh, represented the plaintiffs in a major Supreme Court case addressing the constitutionality of prayer in government meetings. He previously practiced white collar criminal defense, commercial litigation and media law at Covington and Berlin. Our final speaker is Miss Allison Ho, a partner in the Dallas office of Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher, where she leads the firm's nationwide, no, sorry, appellate and constitutional law group practice in Texas. Ms. Ho is recognized as one of the nation's most respected appellate litigators. She is the highest ranked Texas appellate litigator in, uh, for several years running and one of the top appellate lawyers in America. She has argued on one more business cases before the U.S. Supreme Court than any Texas lawyer, but she is also engaged in a significant amount of religious liberty litigation. Uh, with that, we will begin our presentations with Mr. Severino. Take it away. Unmute yourself. <laughs> thank you, Your Honor, and thank you, Dean Reuter and the Federalist Society for inviting me to this important panel. Religious liberty and transition, I could speak with some authority on this question because I was actually on the transition team for President Donald Trump and I was right in the middle of things for four years during President Trump's, I think, watershed work on religious freedom. I think he was the most pro-religious freedom president we have ever had. And part of that begins, began with policy um, through personnel. The people that he appointed were vetted for the religious liberty bona fides. They had to have evidence that they were actually in the trenches and actually stood up for the principles. And once they were put in, they actually delivered. We delivered from our transition plans until those four years, almost all the initiatives that we had thought of and reached for were accomplished. And I'm gonna list several of them in my time now. And we're in another moment of transition. I fear that many of the religious liberty achievements we put in place over the last four years, and even some that preceded that were actually much more bipartisan historically are at risk of being torn down and dismantled. Today is a beautiful day in Washington, D.C. It was a day like this in March of 2017 when President Trump hosted an event in the Rose Garden announcing his first religious liberty executive order. He had a religious liberty executive order every single year. And at that beautiful day in the Rose Garden, he actually invited the Little Sisters of the Poor to come up to stage. And he said, the federal government is finally going to get off your back. For those of you who probably know, but those who might not, the Little Sisters of the Poor were being required by HHS under Obamacare to provide contraceptive coverage to fellow nuns. This, of course, was a violation of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. The Supreme Court has supported them in this view. The federal government finally backed off and issued regulations providing for exemptions for religious and moral convictions on this issue. This was one example of where the federal government took one position switched with the change in administration that had dramatic effects on religious liberty. The Supreme Court has done fairly well in recent years. There's been a string of victories for religious liberty plaintiffs. We don't have that same sort of consistency at the federal level. And we cannot simply rely on the Supreme Court as the final savior for all these disputes. The federal government has its own role to play in enforcing the First Amendment to the Constitution and federal statutes. I'll give you a prime example of this. NIFLA versus Becerra dealt with the state of California trying to force religious groups to actually refer for abortion in the pregnancy resource centers. 
precisely what they're act, trying to prevent is abortion. They were required to refer for them. This was a violation of the First Amendment in Nifla versus Becerra. That's what the Supreme Court held. But my office at HHS also found that California violated the Weldon Amendment, a statute that prohibits federal funds from going to states that discriminate against entities that won't refer, pay for, or cover abortion. So we've seen this issue, rights of conscience, come up time and again where they were not enforced by previous administrations, and we launched a conscience and religious freedom division to cure that oversight. Religious freedom should be treated like every other civil right. We have civil rights offices in every federal agency just about, and you know they enforce sex, race, national origin discrimination, but you don't see that same focus on religious freedom. So I launched an office with career professionals that is dedicated to enforcing these laws, issued a conscience regulation protection, and now the question is, will Biden and his administration continue that tradition to say that it is not up for debate anymore whether or not religious liberty is going to be given equal respect under the law? It was Nifla versus Becerra, and Becerra is now head of HHS. He was found to be in violation of the Weldon Amendment, cost his state $200 million in Medicaid funds, and now he's in charge of the Medicaid fund. So I'm actually not encouraged by the developments, but we've established so many victories that I think it'll be hard to reverse all of them. American people have reached a, a broad consensus, especially on the questions of life and abortion, that whatever one thinks about the legality of the practice, you don't force other people to engage in it or pay for it. We're seeing this same sort of issue on sexual orientation and gender identity. Now that you have same-sex marriage uh, expanding, are we gonna force people to adopt the view that same-sex marriage is equivalent to man-woman marriage, even if it's against their religious beliefs? We're gonna see these conflicts rise again and again. Um, we took a stand very firmly during the Trump administration in favor of religious liberty. I hope that the Biden administration will follow suit. The initial signs, however, are not encouraging, and I hope to explain more of that in the Q&A. Now, I have the pleasure to hand it off to Dan Mack. Unmute, Mr. Mack. Sorry about that, thank you. Um, I wanted to thank you, Roger, for handing it over and the Federalist Society for hosting. Um, when we're assessing how well any administration handles religious liberty, I think it's important to have a clear sense of what we mean when we're talking about religious freedom. All too often these days, the notion of religious liberty gets highly politicized and narrowly defined to fuel the flames of the culture wars. But religious liberty does not belong only to a select few. It, it shouldn't be a proxy for whether one believes in LGBTQ equality or a particular view about reproductive freedom. Um, of course, there are many people in this country with deep, sincere religious convictions in opposition to, say, same-sex marriage or abortion. But not all of the faithful lean in those directions. Many feel, with equally sincere religious fervor, that there is a religious obligation to treat all people equally regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity, uh, or that government has no business interfering with a woman's right to choose. Needless to say, obviously, religion is far from monolithic. There's no one universally accepted Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist approach to profound theological questions. And many people, indeed, a growing number in the U.S., don't self-identify as religious at all. Um, and when talking about religious freedom, we shouldn't lose sight of one of its core components, the separation of religion and government. As our founders knew well, religion thrives best when the government stays out of it and doesn't play favorites or tip the scales to encourage or promote particular religious viewpoints over others. Both religion clauses in the First Amendment, the Free Exercise Clause and the Establishment Clause, advance the cause of religious liberty and work hand in hand to safeguard our first freedom. So. Against this backdrop, how has the executive branch been doing? Uh, I think Greg will be discussing some of the regulations and enforcement mechanisms that Roger just mentioned. So I'd like to focus on another contrast um, between the previous administration and the current one. And I say the current one, you know, obviously we're only a few months in, so who knows what will happen. 
The thing I want to focus on here is the Trump administration's appalling treatment and vilification of an entire faith. Uh, this was among the most dis disgraceful displays of anti-religious bigotry by a modern U.S. administration. And I know this story is well known, but I just want to run through a bit of the lowlights. Uh, in the weeks and months leading up to the 2016 election, uh, Trump expressly attacked and ridiculed Islam and Muslims. He said, Islam hates us. He said, we're having problems with Muslims coming into the country. And then he called for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. And then one week into his presidency, he made good on that promise with an executive order that targeted Muslim majority countries with severe immigration restrictions. He freely admitted that countries were just used as a stand-in for religion in his bag, in his ban, and he bragged on um, National Christian Broadcast Network that the order was designed to favor Christian immigrants over Muslim immigrants. And sure enough, almost all of the hundreds of millions of people affected by the initial version of the ban were Muslim. Other iterations of the Muslim ban followed the same basic game plan, and Trump continued to disparage Muslims and their faith, including just a few examples. He promoted a fake story involving General Pershing and the supposed massacre of Muslims with bullets dipped in pig's blood. He retweeted blatantly anti-Muslim videos, and then his administration expressly connected those tweets to this ban. Now, as most of us know, the Supreme Court eventually let the president get away with it, but only because of the massive deference that it gave him in this context, which was the intersection of immigration and national security, and not because there was any reasonable or innocent spin to um, what he had said. In fact, neither the government lawyers in the case defending this executive order, nor the majority of the court that voted to uphold uh, this executive order even tried to argue against the mountain of evidence of religious animus or to suggest that Trump hadn't displayed any hostility toward Muslims. And it was there, it was just plain as day, it was there, just as when um, then President Trump later retweeted a doc, they were picture of Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer in a hijab and a turban. Now, Trump certainly wasn't the only one in his administration displaying such rampant religious animus. Um, from senior advisors who claim that the West is at war with Islam, to high-ranking officials um, calling Islam the most oppressive, violent religion, declaring that Islam is a vis vicious cancer that must be excised and that fear of Muslims is rational, or calling Islam a barbaric cult. Anti-Muslim bigotry was far too common in the Trump administration. And just take a moment, can you imagine if any administration, any other president, had said a fraction of those things about some other faith? Would there even be a question about a supposed commitment to religious liberty? Fortunately, on his first day in office, President Biden rescinded Trump's uh, Muslim ban, taking a first step toward undoing the significant damage done to our international reputation and our basic values. Um, now, as all of this makes clear, the narrative of the Trump administration as a consistent champion of religious liberty for all just doesn't hold up. But it's hardly the only example. Uh, early in the Trump presidency, then Attorney General Sessions issued a memo telling DOJ attorneys to accommodate religious exercise to the greatest extent possible under law. Yet, it aggressively prosecuted members of a faith-based humanitarian organization for leaving food and water in the southern Arizona desert so migrants wouldn't die. And this is even in the face of express RIFRA defenses, Religious Freedom Restoration Act defenses, by these criminal defendants. The Trump administration also rushed to resume federal execution uh, for the first time in 17 years during a deadly pandemic, uh, executing 13 individuals in the span of six months. Now, not only is that practice, as we know, vehemently opposed by many faith traditions, but the administration also resisted RIFRA claims by clergy seeking a delay in light of COVID concerns um, because they simply wanted to be present at the executions uh, for spiritual support and comfort. Again, the, the Biden administration has signaled its intention to cease the practice of federal executions, though we'll, we'll see what happens on that front. And one quick final contrast between um, the two administrations, at least thus far. 
Uh, the Trump administration showed a clear disregard and, and I think even contempt for the separation of church and state. Uh, this is both in, in court cases supporting um, giant government displays of particular religious symbols and, and supporting compelled taxpayer funding of religion, um, encouraging schools, public schools to teach uh, biblical doctrine, and even um, some officials railing against atheists and others who just simply don't share a particular Christian viewpoint and accusing them of being immoral and plotting the organized destruction of religion. So to sum up, it's too early to tell, but the initial signs from the Biden administration, um, I think they indicate that the new executive branch will take a more inclusive approach to religious liberty. Uh, that's probably a good segue for Greg, so I'll turn it over to him now. Um, thank you, Dan. And, and uh, you know, I think it, it's, it's sort of it's striking to listen to what Roger had to say and what Dan had to say and to hear all the examples of anti-Muslim bigotry in action. Um, you know, Dan didn't mention that there is um, plenty of anti-Semitism at various, you know, uh, various positions in the administration. And, you know, Trump's campaign was endorsed by Nazi parties in the Klan. And to, to digest all of that and say that, Trump was the most pro-religious liberty president you've ever had. And without even addressing any of those other things, I think it does sort of reflect an unexamined assumption in Rogers' remarks that, you know, religious liberty, I think, in, in his view, and not just to single him out, in the views of most of the relevant appointees in the Trump administration, that religious liberty meant um, religious liberty for certain conservative Christians um, at the expense of anyone else and at the expense of, you know, most other faiths as well. And, um, you know, we in theory live in a constitutional democracy, not a Christian theocracy. And so that approach, um, which was pursued quite aggressively, and there I very much agree with Roger that, you know, the Trump administration moved with great speed and efficiency and success, um, leaves a lot of work to do um, to fix things. And I, you know, I think the Biden administration is starting to do that, but I don't know that um, he will undo all of what happened um, during the Trump administration. Um, you know, to, to take a bit of a step back, I think one of the reasons why the Trump administration was able to get most, if not quite all of what it wanted accomplished was that uh, there was a lot of play in the joints here because you were dealing with old statutes that were somewhat broad and somewhat flexible. And so a lot of the relevant protections and laws were regulatory or executive orders. And um, if you squint at my bookshelf, you can see I'm a, a bit of an obsessive of, of biographer Robert Caro. And um, in, a, in a book he wrote, his, his, uh, his slim volume that he wrote in 2019, he's talking about Lyndon Johnson, but I think it applies. He has a quote, the books of law, that was what Johnson felt mattered. An executive order, as we're all learning now to our, to our sorrow, is just a piece of paper and could be repealed by another piece of paper. And you can make a, a similar point about regulations. You can't repeal it quite as, as quickly or easily, but certainly much more easily than you can repeal legislation. Um, and because a lot of the relevant um, inflection points were regulatory and, and um, within the realm of the agencies, that gave the Trump administration and his appointees a lot of latitude to move aggressively, and aggressively they did. Um, another thing I do agree with what Roger said was, you know, looking at um, the personnel, because I think it was very clear from the start that, you know, from the, the appointments that the Trump administration made to key positions um, and key positions that, you know, as to the scope and, and intersection of religious liberty and other rights, um, what direction, you know, this administration was going to be headed. There were no mushy moderates in the Trump administration and the relevant positions. You know, Roger, I think probably most people know his background, but, you know, he was very much a, um, a critic of treating, for instance, um, sexual orientation or gender identity as a, as a protected class. Um, you know, I think I can say that as an understatement. Um, Matthew Bowman, who was the uh, initially deputy general counsel at the Department of Health and Human Services and then went to HHS's Office of Civil Rights, had been a litigator with the Alliance Defending Freedom, had been very active in challenging the contraceptive coverage regulations. Um, the director of the Trump administration's Center for Faith-Based and Community Partnerships was Shannon Royce from um, the Family Research Council and then the uh, Southern Baptist Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. 
Um, Charmaine Yost, he former head of Americans United for Life, was the HHS top spokesman. Um, outside of HHS, I mean, um, Betsy DeVos, you know, was the DeVos Center at the Heritage Foundation that Roger was was ahead of. Betsy DeVos at, at Department of Education, you know, White House domestic policy advisors. Um, and and, and uh, one, one final point at the Department of Justice, Justice, I mean, I think we know about Sessions and Barr, Barr but Trump's, Trump's Solicitor General, General was Noel Francisco. Francisco. Um, one, one of the last cases he had argued when he was in private practice before, before taking that position was uh, in, support in support of a challenge, of a challenge um, not, not just to the contraceptive coverage regulations um, from the Affordable Care Act, but even to the accommodation that was created for nonprofit organizations. So this was a... A, a, a group of people, people in key positions, positions in a position to move aggressively, aggressively who very much had, had a, you know, view of religious liberty that put sort of conservative Christian religious objections um, first and foremost. And, um, and, and the, the resulting policies reflected that. that. I could probably go on for an hour um, about these things, but uh, the music stands ready to play us off, I believe. So I will just co cover a couple of highlights. Um, in, in February 2017, 2017 um, the, the Trump administration, administration withdrew Ob the Obama administration's guidance that um, would, would have allowed uh, transgender, transgender you know, secondary, secondary school students, students to use bathrooms that corresponded, corresponded to, to their gender, gender identity. identity. Um, there, there was the religious liberty guidance that, that Roger mentioned. Um, the, the Department, Department of Health and Human, Human Services, Services repealed um, non-discrimination provisions in the Affordable Care Act that had protected from discrimination uh, not only uh, transgender people, but also uh, protected people from discrimination on the basis of having obtained or sought services related to pregnancy, childbirth, or abortion. Um, Department of Labor guidance that would have allowed basically any federal contractors um, to discriminate on, you know, for religious reasons on the basis of Sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or even religion, right? Just hiring, you know, being able to say, you know, I'm not hiring you because you're Jewish or Muslim. Um, you know, and, and federal contractors employ um, a lot of people, you know, potentially up to, you know, a fourth of the, uh, of the, uh, you know, the workforce. So, um, you know, we're talking everything from Meals on Wheels to foster care agencies to recipients of Head Start grants. Um, the... Not, not only uh, the repeal, uh, uh, or at least the, the, the reinforcement and broadening of exemptions to the contraceptive coverage regulations, um, not, not only extending them to religious objectors, but to people with moral objections, objections and for, for the first time dropping any pretense of making efforts to provide alternative arrangements for women who lost uh, contraceptive coverage as a result. Um, and then, and then finally, finally, we saw this in the positions in the courts. courts. There was there often sort of, sort of a little criminology when the um, Trump DOJ would file a, 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 an appellate or Supreme Court brief in a hotly contested case, because you sort of look at the brief and see, like, how many non-political appointees are there? Is the EEOC on the brief in an employment case? And you sort of saw briefs that were filed in ways that um, not only reflected sort of policy choices, but policy choices that seemed to undermine the scope and application of bedrock federal, federal statutes, for instance, in cases involving Title VII, VII or in other sort of discrimination cases that implicated um, federal public accommodation laws. And so, yes, yeah, so I think, you know, Trump administration moved aggressively. They hit, you know, um, I would say the Supreme Court's decision in Bostick, which held that Title VII sex discrimination uh, prohibition extends to sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, you know, I think is a, a bit of a roadblock for their efforts, especially if it is extended to other statutes like Title IX. Um, but on the whole, you know, this was fast moving. Their arms didn't need to be twisted as, you know, the Obama, the, the, you know, I think uh, uh, people on my side of things um, felt like we were often having to twist the arms of the Obama administration to make changes that ended up happening more slowly and um, less fully than we thought. And I think, the, you know, um, People who shared Rogers' views did not have that problem with the Trump administration. Um, in terms of what's going to happen on the Biden administration, I think the prognosis is encouraging but mixed. Um, I think we do not have the, we are not getting the Democratic equivalent of the Trump administration's approach to these issues. Um, you know, Xavier Becerra is a, I think, encouraging choice at HHS. Um, well, perhaps during the discussion, get into a bit more of the details as to what uh, his cases involved. I'm not sure I, I 
quite agree with how Roger characterized them, but I think he has certainly been a major supporter of reproductive rights. Um, in contrast to the sort of aggressively anti-transgender policy um, initiatives coming out of the Trump administration, you know, it was notable that uh, Rachel Levine, who was um, appointed and confirmed as an assistant secretary in HHS, becoming the first openly transgender person to hold a Senate confirmed office. And I think that isn't a policy that, you know, that, that doesn't directly change policy, but I think it's important sort of given the vulnerability of especially, you know, transgender youth and the sort of, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the force that they were met from, you know, the administration, the, the past administration. Um, Department of Justice, it's a little unclear. You know, Merrick Garland is more, more of a prosecutor's prosecutor, um, but Vanita Gupta, a, a, you know, a, a has a civil rights background. And- uh, Ms. Walker, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, you've, you've, I've given you at least a minute and a half extra, sure. so thank you though. Yeah, thank you. If, if, if I can just add, if I can just say one more sentence, and I think we've had a, a, several of the regulatory changes made by the Trump administration have been repealed or withdrawn, um, but several others have not. And um, I think that is a mixed record right now, and I'm looking forward to discussing kind of what's what remains and what has um, been taken off the books. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Allison. Thank you, Greg. Um, if, if I could take a moment of personal privilege, I want to thank the Federal Society for hosting this important conference and for the opportunity to participate in it. I've been active in the Federal Society since I was a 1L in law school. It's been one of the most rewarding parts of my career as a lawyer and its work of fostering debate on the most significant issue, significant legal issues of our day has really never been more important. So thank you again for the opportunity to participate uh, in today's conference and on this panel to talk about something else very near and dear to my heart, and that's religious liberty. I'd like to make three points today, um, two briefly and one more expansively. First, I'd like to underscore what should be, I hope, an obvious point, and that's that religious liberty isn't a benefit that the executive branch can dispense or withhold on its whim. It's a foundational right, um, often described as our first freedom. And Dan, I was heartened to hear you refer to it as that. Um, that's the default rule in our constitutional republic. Congress shall make no law, the First Amendment says, respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise of the same. So the question for us today is really what role will or should the executive branch play in enforcing or vindicating that fundamental right? Second, if the mantra in real estate is location, 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 the mantra in executive branch enforcement is priority, priority, priority. As a practical matter, especially given the immense uh, scope and reach of the federal government today, if something isn't a priority for the executive branch, it's highly unlikely to happen, even if it's something that the administration deems a good or, or worthy thing. And that's especially true when it comes to religious liberty, which touches virtually every uh, department or component in the executive branch, as Roger was, was touching on, but isn't the primary responsibility of any. Third, from the practical perspective of a litigator in this area, it's difficult to overstate the immense difference it makes in matters large and small when religious liberty is an executive branch priority. We tend to focus, rightly so, on the things that grab headlines, the regulations, the departmental working groups, the executive orders, uh, the departmental working groups, and, and putting a a premium and priority on religious liberty abroad. Without diminishing the importance of any of those things, I'd like to focus very briefly on one of the smaller and perhaps underappreciated, but still very impactful way uh, an ex the executive branch, uh, an executive branch focused on making religious liberty a priority can make a difference in the courts. And that way is the Je Department of Justice's filing of statements of interest. 
in cases at all levels of the judiciary, including in cases that implicate religious liberty. For example, in May of 2020, the department filed a statement of interest in a Colorado uh, federal court supporting the First Amendment religious freedom claims of a church and its pastor. The statement emerged from a directive uh, given by uh, Attorney General Barr that the department should review state and local policies to ensure that civil liberties, including religious liberty, are protected during the COVID-19 pandemic. We appreciate the challenging position that the state and the governor face in trying to balance public safety with personal and religious freedoms, wrote the U.S. Attorney for the District of Colorado. But when government restrictions cross the line into unconstitutional violations of religious liberty, he went on, it is my duty and that of the Department of Justice to engage and protect those interests. In its statement of interest, the department explained that because Colorado appeared to be treating similarly situated non-religious activity, such as in-person dining in restaurants, better than religious activity, including in houses of worship, Colorado's actions may constitute a violation of the church's constitutional right to the free exercise of religion. The department filed statements in similar cases across the country, from Washington State to New York, seeking to protect religious liberty during the pandemic. Those statements of interest uh, didn't always or even usually make headlines, but I'm sure that, that the parties seeking to vindicate their religious liberties rights in those cases were very grateful for the assist from the department. If only to underscore the larger point that religious liberty isn't a luxury that we enjoy during good times, but a right worthy of protection and vindication, even or especially during times of crisis. I look forward to the discussion with my fellow panelists and questions from the audience. Thank you. Okay, um, it's customary at, at times like this for us to go briefly uh, through the roster of speakers and see if any of you have comments on what uh, the other speakers have said so we'll I think we agreed to go about two to three minutes each and we'll start with Roger <clears throat> well where to begin um, my name was invoked so I'll answer about some of these very specific things but some of the flavor of the arguments from Dan and Greg amount to orange man bad I mean we've seen this time and again that it all comes down to what Trump may or may not have tweeted the Supreme Court on the travel ban case, as Dan noted, ruled in favor of the Trump administration ultimately, right? And if you see what the actual policies that were implemented by the Trump administration, they were always about religious freedom for everybody. There's not a single action that you could point to in any regulation we did that said, this is for Christians only, or even conservative Christians as has been bandied about. Um, there were religious freedom orders from the president every single year, which were neutral because of religious liberty is a right for everybody. There was one specific religious liberty order, and that was an anti-Semitism religious liberty order, which kind of seems to upset the narrative that Dan and Greg are trying to portray. Um, it doesn't fit that story so neatly, does it? However, that does show that where the need is greatest, that's where the administration focused its attention. On the issues of uh, conscience, those are federal statutes that had not been enforced for years, passed on a bipartisan basis by presidents of both parties. We were finally actually enforcing those statutes. That is the main difference between the Trump administration, Obama, and what seems to be the Biden administration. In terms of what, what we're doing and why, Look at the actual policies. I'll go back to this. Look at the actual policies. We did the outreach to all the groups to get all their input. We followed the rules of rulemaking. Contrast that to the Biden administration, which announced just last week that they're going to impose a sexual orientation and gender identity policy without going through rulemaking. No public comments. We went through about 200,000 comments, read every single one, responded to all of them and actually address the religious liberty concerns. Are hospitals gonna be required to perform sex reassignment surgeries on minors if it's against their religious beliefs? We answered that very, very clearly. 
the Biden administration is saying, well, we're not going to go to the rulemaking process. We're going to respect RIFRA, whatever that means. At the same time, President Biden wants to sign the Equality Act that would actually erase RIFRA from civil rights protections. So we know where they're going on this. Their view of religious liberty is one that is something that is purely private, that it should be done on Saturday or Sunday or Friday, not during the work week. And that's what the Trump administration put, pushed back against religious liberty for all religions. Uh, Dan? Oh, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know it was. I guess we're keeping the order, same order. Um, yeah, just just a, a few a few points in in response to that. Well, first of all, um, I agree with Allison that religious liberty is not a benefit that is you know that that can be dispensed or eliminated by the executive branch. I, I do think it is a crucial fundamental right, um, I, and I think where we disagree may be on the the extent and limits of that right and and how much it can be invoked in ways that may um, intrude on the rights of others. But but I totally agree that it is a crucial um, right and, and that's one that's not left to, to the whims of, of the, uh, the executive branch. Um, I, I also, uh, well, to, to, to Roger's point, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that, that all of a sudden words don't matter. Um, I mean, these, these, you know, some, some policies were announced in tweets. It's not that tweets are irrelevant and it's not just tweets. It's statements to rile folks up, um, to lead them toward oftentimes um, harmful action. And those things have consequences. And when you attack an entire faith, again, I return to the point, can you imagine if another president attacked one single faith in the way that this, uh, that Trump and the Trump administration did for Muslims, um, what sort of uproar we would see? It, it's, 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 I mean, it, it's an easy question to answer. And, and as for I, I, the executive actions, the actual regulations and rules, uh, I will just point out that many of those were challenged, not only on their substance, but also as a violation of the APA. So on procedural grounds, because proper procedures in so many situations were not followed. I'll turn over to Greg after that. So I I, I think, I, you know, I, I don't know that this should bear repeating, but I really think it, it needs to bear repeating again that, that you know, religious liberty um, is not just religious liberty for people who object to marriage equality or LGBT rights or, you know, abortion, um, and and you know to say well you know obviously we all we'll have, have to agree, agree that religious liberty, liberty comes first. first. I mean, yes, I mean religious liberty is is a bedrock constitutional right, but it's not self-executing, um, and we live in a pluralistic country with people with a lot of different religious beliefs and a lot of different other interests and everyone has, everyone has a right to live their lives and so to say well obviously he need, he put religious liberty first you, you know it's it's um you you can say that only if you define religious liberty very narrowly and you know it was interesting that when we got to the muslim ban rogers like oh don't worry about the tweets and look at the third iteration really closely you know when it comes to the contraceptive coverage regulations and the little sisters of the poor had an exemption um, because they were a church plan and in any event had to fill out a form that would enable a third party to provide the coverage, um, that nuanced approach goes away and it's Obama administration is forcing the nuns to hand out birth control. Um, when it's Trump, you know, says he wants to ban an entire religion from entering the country, then it's like, ah, don't worry about the orange guy and like, you know, so I, I think we can't have it both ways. If we're going to um, use hyperbole to describe you know, LGBT rights protections or reproductive rights protections, then then we can't um, we we can't get all uh, we we can't get all exonerative when it comes to um, you know things like the Muslim ban. Um, the final thing is I, I want to talk about anti-Semitism for a moment also because um, one of the first things that happened in the Trump administration and this was very January or early February of 2017, which was that the um, the State Department issued a Holocaust memorial statement uh, that didn't mention Jews. 
And it turned out that the White House had blocked the State Department from issuing a statement that had mentioned Jews. And, um, you know, again, like, um, and, 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 and uh, regulations that allow federal contractors to discriminate on the basis of religion can affect Jews and it can affect Muslims, it can affect Catholics or other Christians, it can affect. So I, I guess I'll, I'll end where I started that it is, it does little work to say that Trump stood for religious liberty. You know, it's in the First Amendment, it trumps everything. Really the question is what is religious liberty? Who is protected and who is not? And if, as Roger says, you look at the policies, all of the policies, um, you know, it was a low watermark for, the Trump administration was a low watermark for religious liberty. Um, and, you know, the Biden administration is starting to correct it, but still has a long way to go. Allison, unmute. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, you know, I feel like we've, and I'm going to pull my pull out my appellate litigator reply card and sort of focus less on what we have heard and what I have, what I don't think we have heard um, from Dan and Greg. We've heard a lot of of criticism about how the previous administration treated. Um, prioritize or handled religious liberty. Um, but I don't know that we've heard as much about what they would like to see other than, and maybe the answer is just, you know, doing the opposite of everything that the Trump administration did. But I'd be, I'd actually be very interested in Dan and Greg's views on sort of if they don't like anything, and it sounds like they didn't the Trump administration did, although I don't want to put words in their mouth, maybe they there are things they would highlight that they'd agree with. Um, what would you like to see happen other than just dismantling everything that, that came before? You've both expressed a commitment to and an appreciation of religious liberty. Um, what, what's your view of, of what, what, what positive steps could we envision for religious liberty, our first freedom under a Biden administration? Um, I I'd be happy to address that if uh, Judge Jones will uh, uh, authorizes it. Well, if you'll, yeah, if you'll, um, uh, yes, try to be pithy. I, I will do my best. Um, so I, th I think a couple of things. I think one, you know, some of these are simply fixing what happened before. And then I think some of it is, is um, moving in new directions. I think the first thing is sort of re- um, reiterating uh, sort of the, the pluralistic um, belief in everyone's religious freedom to believe what they want or not believe what they want. And um, so, you know, things like eliminating, um, you know, explicit or tacit um, restrictions on immigration based on people's faith. I mean, you can say it's just, you know, opposition to what came before, but it was a major um, overhang. And so sort of getting rid of things like that, I think, is important. Um, you know, uh, extending the civil rights laws as consistent with Supreme Court precedent in Bostick um, so that sex discrimination is properly understood to include discrimination on the basis of sex and sexual orientation and gender identity, I think um, is another important factor. And again, I think sort of, and, and I think Dan, I don't want to speak for Dan, but I think he'll say the same thing. I think both Dan and I very much support religious accommodations and religious exemptions in a, in a wide range of areas. But I think the, the overriding principle, and I think the inexor, you know, the, the um, unavoidable principle in a pluralistic democracy is that exemptions that cause real harm to others um, are much harder to justify. And I think sort of resetting and re restoring the religious accommodation regime so that you know, if someone needs, you know, I just finished representing, for instance, a prisoner who needed fast replacement meals for his religious fast in prison. Like that is a pain for the government. Yes, um, maybe cost them a little extra money, but ultimately doesn't really harm anyone else and allows the prisoner to practice his faith. And I know, you know, Americans United and I know ACLU works on a lot of cases like that. Sort of getting back to the, the nuts and bolts of religious liberty. Um, rather than sort of the regime in which religious liberty is focused and in which the priorities are on um, sort of religious liberty as a basis to deny other people 
their own rights, I think is essential. And I think it's also critical for long-term popular support for religious liberty. One okay. of the reasons that, that RIFRA support is, is okay, diminishing Mr. because- uh, Okay, it, you're, you're going, yes, uh, you're very expansive. Uh, and <laughs> that's, I think, that's why they pay me. <laughs> uh, and this is, I mean, I don't really object to that, but I want to give everybody a fair chance. But I do, uh, since um, Allison and Roger haven't mentioned this, I feel constrained to point out that what you keep calling the Muslim ban was a ban on immigration from only a few Muslim countries in the world heavily identified with terrorists, and that um, many Muslim countries representing at least, if I recall correctly, three quarters of the entire several billion population of Muslims in the world were not banned from immigrating. Uh, I also think that anyone daring to call this administration anti-Semite has to respond to the recent activity of many in the Democrat Party um, who are supporting uh, uh, Palestine, Palestinians throwing thousands of rockets into the, into the population of Israel. And a former law clerk of mine in particular would take issue with this theory about the uh, Trump administration and anti-Semitism her name is Sigal Mandelker. She was the head of anti-terrorism finance in the, uh, in the uh, Treasury Department. She gave a commemorative speech on National Holocaust Memorial Day about her parents' uh, close escape from the ovens when they were but infants. Um, and of course, this president is the first one in American history to be the father-in-law of Orthodox Jews. Uh, you know, this idea uh, doesn't bear further analysis. Now, I do think that the questions about gender identity and so on can be pursued uh, among, among the panel. I think those are very relevant. I will move to one question that we've been asked. Uh, this is a fellow, whoops, if I didn't lose it. Dang it. I need to scroll down there. He said he fought against, uh, he fought with uh, Iraqi um, uh, troops in, in that war. And he was just wondering what Mr. Mack and Mr. Lipper would think about importing um, notions of uh, polygamy or applying Sharia law it, uh, domestically in the United States is a matter of religious liberty. If one of you would, does one of you have an answer to that? I, I'm, I'm not sure Sharia law is on the table, um, uh, much, less, much less that any individual would be able to as a matter of religious liberty. Um, I do think the question implicates the importance of separating church and state and the importance of not allowing any one religious group to sort of have their um, particular beliefs trump all other rights of, of people of other religions um, and people of no religion. I mean, the, if you if you're concerned with quote unquote Sharia law, um, which I mean, I know we had these Sharia law bans a few years ago that, you know, were all struck down as and, and we're not responding to anything actual. But um, it, if if you say you, you mean Sharia, if 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 your concern is allowing a single religion's doctrine to control the actual civil law, then you should support robust separation of church and state, um, and you should support religious freedom that recognizes pluralism and doesn't favor one particular group's belief. Um, so I guess that's that's what I would say. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't support Sharia law, nor do I support um, any faith's law um, trumping, you know, the secular um, constitutional order that we have. And Judge, may I respond to that? Sure. The the broader point I think Greg and Dan are making are one is one that treats religion a bit like secondhand smoke. 
You could do it in private, but if it has any negative impact on anybody else, then it has to give way because that would be an imposition of somebody's religious beliefs and that cannot possibly be allowed in a pluralistic, pluralistic society. That's a very crabbed and narrow view and it squelches the grand diversity of human expression, which includes the religious impulse. You're free to believe and not believe, you're free to express and live it. So how does this actually play out in practice? So we've had all, all sorts of cases we've been talking about where the Trump administration actually won. So the position that Dan and Greg has been uh, portraying lost at the Supreme Court, it has not been an imposition of religion. And on the question of imposition of third party costs, we don't look at it in that frame for other civil rights. Look at the Americans with Disabilities Act. It required companies to retrofit housing, public accommodations, billions of dollars. That's a real imposition to build ramps and cutouts and braille everywhere in this country. Everybody had to shoulder a burden. But with religion, you cannot. It's somehow verboten because it's a disfavored civil right, perhaps. No. It's the first civil right that's that's enshrined in our constitutions. So we got to get away from this third burden party um, conception because that is really something about civil rights that is consistent with all of them. Can uh, judge? Can I respond? Certainly. Yep. Thanks. Um, so so lest uh, my position be um, crafted out of whole cloth by someone else, let me just be clear. For over a century at the ACLU, we have been defending the right to religious practice and expression, whether it's exercised quietly and privately or loudly and publicly. And there are so many examples. We, you know, in public schools, we've opposed bans on Catholic rosaries, are argued for students' right to sing religious songs in after school talent shows. We've represent, represented synagogues, churches, and mosques, Christian street preachers. I mean, the list is quite long. And so it, that, that's just a, a misconception. And just one, one small thing on, on um, what Roger just said. Uh, it, it sounded like he said the Supreme Court ruled in his favor, therefore that must be the correct result. If that were true, um, then surely he should be embracing Roe versus Wade, which he's not. So it, it can't be the case that just because a, any given Supreme Court says so, that, that means that is the uh, absolute objective right answer. We all disagree with some um, amount of judicial decisions out there. I agree. Okay, let me uh, uh, pose another question in the last, in the aftermath of this may not, I, I wish the people uh, asking questions would try to uh, model on the, on lest the panelists be shocked or surprised, model it on the um, the topic here, which is uh, this administration's approach to religious liberty in the previous administration. Some of the questions are a little bit more uh, general in nature, but it, there's an interesting one about whether either anyone thinks that in the wake of the Espinosa uh, v. Montana case last year, uh, the Blaine amendments uh, nationwide are going to be um, modified. Does anyone I'll, have an opinion about that? I'll take that one, um, Judge Jones. I certainly hope so. Um, I, I think the, the history of Blaine amendments of anti-Catholic uh, bigotry in, in this country is certainly one of the, um, the more shameful chapters um, in our nation's history. And I think it, it, it shows um, through a cautionary tale um, the tremendous importance of of, of religious liberties. So I uh, I certainly I certainly hope uh, that the message that the Supreme Court sent last uh, last term against that sort of the, these sort of remaining vestiges of um, really offensive anti Catholic uh, bigotry uh, will be seen for what they are and demolished. Does Does anyone have an opinion as to how this administration? would react if, if a case actually uh, started being litigated again? Mr. Magnus. Meaning uh, a case on, on this particular issue? Well, something, yeah, right. Uh, something. On the funding question. Right. Uh, 
yeah. So um, obviously we could debate so many of these individual points. We could take an hour and a half for, for any of them. I disagree with um, uh, Ms. Ho's historical analysis. Um, uh, there, there's certainly some history of, of disgraceful anti-Catholic bigotry in this country, but it is not the case that, that all of these no aid provisions, which are in place in over three quarters of the states, um, derive from that history and the court and majority of the court has never said that they do. Right now, um, where we are after that Espinoza decision, there is still um, room for uh, states to say we are not going to fund um, religious activity. Um, the, the opinions seem pretty clear that you, the states can't, and, and I assume this, you know, this applies to the federal constitution, applies to the federal government as well, can't say we are not funding um, a, an entity simply because of their religious identity. Um, that seems to have been answered by these cases. Um, but what is still open is the ability of governments from the federal on down to say, we are not going to fund religious activity. And in, in fact, I'd argue that, that the Establishment Clause still prohibits the funding of such. Well, I, and from that, can, would, would you suspect that this administration would file an amicus brief uh, if such a, you know, when, I, when such a case comes up uh, in favor of the state? Or would it depend on a state-by-state -state basis and whether the provision in question historically had an anti-Catholic animus. I, I think it would depend on the situation. I mean, I, I, I would hope that, that the current administration, like, just like I would hope the previous administration, uh, with, with less optimism back then, but, but I would hope the current administration would still embrace the idea that the First Amendment Establishment Clause um, allows states and indeed requires states not to fund um, religious activity with direct funding. Whether they're going to do it, that's that's up for grabs. I don't know if they're going to act more cautiously um, given the um, current landscape. Yeah, and, and if, if I could add just one point to that, I mean, uh, in the, the Obama administration, earlier in the Obama administration, there was a case, um, it was an establishment cost challenge to a voucher-like uh, tuition tax credit program in Arizona. And the Obama administration actually filed um, in defense of that program, um, I think sort of disappointing a lot of uh, people, myself included, who thought that it raised serious establishment clause concerns. And so I, I think on questions like that, the jury is is still out. And they, you know, I, I for one am, um, I'm always less optimistic about how these things are gonna turn out, but you know, I think it's, it's less clear how questions like that are gonna play out under this administration. And if I may add, because this is a CLE, I will mention a case, Ramos versus Louisiana, which came out in 2020, dealt with whether or not uh, Louisiana and Oregon had non-unanimous juries, which were tainted by a racist history. They wanted to be able to veto, say, an African-American who was on a, juror, on a jury. And several justices said that tainted history is relevant today because the effects of discrimination are ongoing, even if so much time has passed or it has been readopted. If they didn't explicitly reject the bias of the past, it is suspect. Same with the Blaine Amendments. If these states do not explicitly reject the undisputed anti-Catholic bigotry of the 1850s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, then they are sus suspect under the Constitution. And, and, and I think Roger uh, reinforces why the Supreme Court decision in the Muslim ban case was so disappointing, because you had a very, um, albeit short, very intensive history of clear anti-Muslim animus and statements that seem very clearly to be anim animating um, the policy and, uh, and its various iterations. And, and in that situation, it seemed, to, um, it seemed to not be taken into account. And so I do think um, whatever one approach chooses, I, I, I think it really is necessary both in fact and for appearance's sake to um, you know, treat history, you know, be it you know, racist history, anti-Muslim history, anti-Catholic history, um, treat it consistently and not treat sort of history of discrimination against one group uh, as more important than a history of discrimination against another religious group, for instance. Okay, we have some uh, good questions here. One of them is um, what, what you think is the future of the lemon test? And I, again, I'd say 
given that at one point, I think seven members of the then Supreme Court had criticized the lemon test. What, what will this administration do if and when uh, a case presents itself uh, on the Establishment Clause invoking the lemon test? Who wants to start off? Dan? You don't have to. No, I'm happy to. Uh, I, I mean, it's been under fire for a while, but it's still holding on um, by its fingertips. So it's it's unclear uh, where the court's going to go. Obviously, there, as you mentioned, Your Honor, there, there have been a number of signals from current justices suggesting that they really don't like it. Um, but I, I don't know. One of the big problems with replacing it is what replaces it. And each time something is proposed, I think there the, the court has struggled with great difficulty to um, to unify, or at least five of them, to unify around what's the new test. And a lot of things have been proposed, historical test, coercion, um, endorsements floating around, or has. So I, I think that's one of the, the, the big open questions. If Lemon goes, what do we have after it? Anyone else? Okay, and the next question is, uh, what's going to be the status of the contraception mandate? And uh, put more bluntly, is is this administration going to sue the Little Sisters again? Well, they can't, <clears throat> specifically Little Sisters, because there is an actual injunction. Um, however, the Little Sisters are at risk because the new mandate uh, might contradict with the old one, depending on what courts say. So it's very, very tricky what the, all the contours are going to be. I will say this, that the Biden administration has not given any good signs that they want to protect groups like the Little Sisters of the Poor. On the question of abortion, it's been about coercion. It's being led by Javier Becerra, who could not, who could not identify a single abortion restriction he would support during his confirmation hearing, even partial birth abortion. He couldn't even acknowledge that partial birth abortion is actually still illegal in his most recent hearing. And he's the head of HHS now. So I would imagine that he would move aggressively any way he can against the Little Sisters because he in fact filed a brief in a case where they intervened in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, I would presume that would continue, especially on the regulatory side. Are they gonna get rid of the contraceptive mandate exception and exclusion? I hope not. Um, if they try to do it, it's really just to score political points to make sure that people who uh, uh, have to toe the new line, which is ideologically driven, that if you do not buckle, then you will face consequences. Women can receive contraceptives easily. They have the Title X program. Why are you going to force nuns to participate in that? It doesn't make sense, but it seems like the Biden administration is going in that direction. I have to say the notion that the Little Sisters of the Poor, first of all, were ever sued, uh, they weren't, they brought their own challenge, and second, that they ever faced any risk of enforcement of any contraceptive regulation is a, a, a I, I mean, it's, one, it's actually sort of one of, the, one of the more glorious fictions of the entire um, Affordable Care Act history, and there have been many. Um, the Little Sisters have been protected by the church plan exemption during the entire time, um, and so I, I know it's a very, I know they make that makes for a very sympathetic group. I know it's a nice talking point, but um, it is hard to take seriously this. They're forcing the little sisters to provide contraception when A, they have a fully exempt plan and B, um, even if they didn't, all they would have to do is sign a piece of paper that would enable a third party to provide it. Um, more generally, all that said, I think we don't know yet. I think my, my general rule of thumb is that the contraceptive coverage litigation is going to like go on past my retirement and past my death because it never seems to end. So I think that, um, you know, take the take the over on how long it's going to go on. The Biden administration has not said what it is going to do yet. And I think we just don't know um, what they're going to do. They, you know, and, and there's a lot of different layers and a lot of different groups involved. Um, I think more broadly, though, the contraceptive coverage regulations, which is sort of one aspect of, of the broader point of like, you know, Roger said, you, you know, are we treating religion like secondhand smoke? And, and no, we're not. But I think we have to recognize that people, you know, there's a lot of different realms. There's the private realm, there's the public realm, there's the commercial realm, there's the going, 
going to the doctor realm and that um, people absolutely need to be able to practice their faith. At the same time, people need to be able to get medical care, get employment benefits. Well, um, Mr. Mack, well, Mr. Mack why, can't, why can't a baker uh, refuse to bake a wedding cake for a same-sex couple when there's another baker down the street whom, to whom he refers the uh, patrons? Hey, Judge uh, before, before he answers, could I could I just uh, bother you? Uh, pardon the interjection to mention the CLE password. If you could mention the CLE password. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. This is like a hurricane warning or something. The CLE password for those participating is. We resume our we resume our conversation. That was uh, far more important than whatever I have to say <laughs> afterwards. Um, I, the reason why we, we we shouldn't allow that is the same reason why we shouldn't allow someone to turn away someone because of their race or their faith simply because you can't you can't eat at my lunch counter but go down the street you can well, eat at that me, lunch counter. Well, let me let me ask you further then, Dan. Um, uh, what do you do when one item of freedom, uh, which you say is transgender, let us say, conflicts with another item of freedom, which is women's rights, girls' rights? And so how do you resolve the conflict that is being um, waged all over the country right now about transgender participation in, in girls' sports? Because don't don't the girls have a right to compete with people who are biologically equipped with the same uh, musculature? So that is obviously a separate question. And my, my answer on that is um, trans girls are girls and should be allowed to compete with other girls. Well, except that you know that and do you know any trans, trans, so-called trans girls that have been failures in, in sports competition? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch the question. Oh, never mind. I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a moderator. I lose my place. But, well, I, could, I could respond to that on the religious sure. liberty side of, of the question. So the, the question of what is male or female is incredibly important for science, for medicine, for sports, etc. And the religious liberty implication is, can somebody disagree on that question and not be cut out from polite society? Uh, there's a risk that with the latest transgender mandate from HHS with respect to medicine, they're going to say that you cannot respect people who think that sex is male and female and biologically determined, that you have to say a person's sex is whatever they say it is. And if you don't go along, regardless of your religious beliefs, then you're you're gonna be cut off from federal funding. I think that's a religious aspect. You have the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Does the Biden administration think there's a compelling interest in sexual orientation, gender identity policies that would override the religious interest to say, for example, use uh, uh, avoiding the use of pronouns altogether? Or must they say, this person is identifies as a man, and you must say they are a man, regardless of your beliefs about creation or biology. That's the way it's got to be, or you lose federal funds. That's the religious liberty and a question. I think Biden administration, with Dr. Rachel Levine and others, are going to say you have to go along with the new ideology. I, I mean, I think ultimately, though, if I may rephrase kind of Roger's question, I mean, do transgender people, including transgender children, have a right to exist? Um, yes, they know, do. Well, but but do they have the right to exist as sort of and and be treated as human? Um, yes, they do. You know, I I I call Roger, you know, Mr. Roger Severino, and I think he would um, presumably, and I wouldn't undertake to call him Ms. Roger Severino, even if I genuinely believed, as a matter of ideology, religion, or otherwise, that he was actually um, a woman. Right? It's common courtesy. Um, and, and when you're having sort of First Amendment challenges or religious challenges by, you know, teachers who refuse to call 
their students by their preferred pronouns, that's, that's getting into dehumanizing. When you're saying that we need to inspect the genitalia of people on sports teams, um, you know, even though there are all sorts, I mean, there are all sorts of body types around. There are women who are taller, there are women who are shorter, there are women who are more muscular, there are women who are less muscular. You know, um, when you're talking about discrimination that people have a right to receive medical care or education, um, you know, without discrimination on the basis of their gender identity. And by the way, as, you know, uh, as sex has been interpreted definitively in a 6-3 decision of the U.S. Supreme Court, written by a Trump appointee. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think, you know, the people are absolutely free to debate how they think gender should be defined, whether it's biological, whether it's psychological, whether it's anything else. But, um, you know, I think the, the, the question really, and, and polite society is not really, I mean, what what okay. private entities do or don't do is 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 not the government's business. Right. But okay. ultimately, okay. but okay. Who transgender people have a right to be. Um, Thank you, Mr. Lipper. Services. Thank you, Mr. Lipper. <laughs> we're getting a, we're getting a little repetitive. Another question that was asked is uh, that the uh, Trump. I'm sorry. The several previous administrations, including the Clinton administration published guidance on religion in the public schools. And I can remember the Clinton one, actually, I had to read it, uh, about what could be taught about religion in the public schools. The Obama administration did not do, that, do such a guidance. I believe the Trump administration did. Is this administration going to provide any guidance? Any predictions? Other than the 1619 project? Okay, I'll move to the next one. Someone asked. I, I, I actually, actually, the one, I mean, the one thing I'll say is I think there's Mr. been very. Lipper, Mr. Lipper, 30 seconds. Yes, or no? <laughs> I will. I'll try to time myself. Um, I, I think there are often times, you know, there, the guidance often involves um, from administration to administration. And so, I imagine, I don't know for a fact, but I imagine the Biden administration may uh, modify some of the existing guidance. I, I don't think it's gonna be a whole new thing, but I imagine there may be some um, changes on the margins from the previous administration. Okay, great. Yeah, and if I may, just one one small thing to add, sure. uh, Ron. Uh, what was interesting, I think, about the Trump guidance on public schools is that there was a lot of discussion in anticipation of it, and there was some degree of hype when it came out, but in the end, it actually wasn't that different. Um, so I suspect that uh, if there are tweaks, it won't be significantly different than the ones we've seen previously. All righty. Um, there is another question. Uh, what what position do you think this administration would take on employment division versus Smith? I'll take that. It, if it is challenged, uh, in the sense that plaintiffs want it to be pared back to go back to the original Sherbert versus Werner test, then I would imagine the administration might oppose that. Uh, because they oppose RIFRA. If they're in support of the Equality Act and some other bills on Congress, which have signaled that would gut RIFRA, then they would not want Employment Division versus Smith pulled back at all. I think RIFRA has served as an incredible check um, so far on the federal government. It, the Supreme Court in case after case has ruled against the federal government in many different contexts. And that, that is one of the last stands so I would imagine they would do anything to push away from rig vigorous RIFRA enforcement and to not constitutionalize RIFRA if they could avoid it. And I think that's, that's my prediction. I, I don't know that it's fair to say the Biden administration opposes RIFRA. I think they believe certain applications of RIFRA are incorrect. Um, I'm pretty sure Biden voted for RIFRA. Um, I don't know where they're going to come out on the Smith question. I think Smith has been pared back quite significantly by the courts anyway. And so it may be ultimately sort of an academic question. Um, but, but my reading of the Biden administration, as was my reading of the Obama administration, is that they, they do support religious accommodations in a wide range of contexts. 
uh, but they draw the line when those accommodations do significant harm um, to third parties or discriminate significantly against third parties. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another Trump regulation someone asked about that they, the administration promulgated a rule that said, I assume in, obviously in connection with federal funding, that um, student groups on campus would be allowed, religious student groups would be allowed to choose leaders of their own faith. Uh, does anyone foresee this administration trying to back down on, on that regulation? Well, good, maybe not. <laughs> maybe that means they won't. Um, uh, let's see, there, someone has asked a question here. Are there any reflections on Biden COVID regulations and funding and possible collisions with religious liberty? Is there, is there anything going on in regard to that anymore now that I guess the money is still going out even though the uh, maybe the need is much smaller than it was recently? There was a question as to whether PPP, the funding for people who were hurt economically, if religious organizations would be allowed to receive funding. And my view is they would be an establishment clause and free exercise clause violation, um, more free exercise actually, if the federal government were to say religious organizations cannot receive PPP funds when everybody else can get PPP funds. That's an important issue. I'm not sure how the Biden administration is going to address it. There's an additional issue that we saw with whether or not houses of worship would be allowed to reopen on an equal basis. We had some guidance that I actually had to fight uh, to prevent the CDC from going too far in regulating the actual practice of worship. And the Supreme Court has actually vindicated that position in a series of cases that you have to have equal treatment when you're exerting a public safety rationale. You can't single out religious belief and exercise is somehow more dangerous than comparable secular behavior. I think the key in those cases and, and in future cases, and this applies not only to the COVID area, but I guess to free exercise um, more broadly, is what is comparable. Right. Um, and there, there's a real disagreement about um, what activities are comparable from a public health perspective. Um, and you saw those in the, in the differing opinions. This is in some of these shadow docket decisions that the Supreme Court has issued um, with, you know, the, the majority saying um, anything is comparable, essentially. And with the dissent saying, no, you're comparing um, apples and watermelons. So I think I think the real the, the key question there is going to be what do we count as comparable, as legally comparable? And, and, and by comparable, I think the, you know, the question should be what um, advances the state's asserted interest, whatever they may be, in a similar way. And, and, and by the way, that's why I sort of uh, circling back to an earlier question, I think that's why Employment Division versus Smith is not long for this world, even if it's never formally overruled, that um, as more and more, it's the, the Supreme Court is more and more saying, if you have any exemption for anyone, um, no matter how non-comparable, it's, it's no longer a neutral law of general applicability. And so we're out of the Smith test. And so I think uh, what Dan alluded to, I think um, Smith is going to become a dead letter just because the definition of what's comparable and what's not comparable is being um, sort of adjusted in a way that almost everything is now getting strict, everything will get, or most things will get strict, uh, strict scrutiny. And, and I think you're right with the direction. And I think there's good reason for that, which was illustrated precisely by the COVID pandemic. Singing in the church is no different than singing a Broadway musical. It's no different than being close together in a movie theater or a casino. But you saw that casinos where you're allowed to be around craps tables and you know serving mammon, but you couldn't serve God in a house of worship. And you cannot privilege some activities over others compared to religion. And that's the issue. And the problem is as society is getting more and more secular, you're gonna see a lot of decision makers say, Religion just isn't that important. What's the big deal? You don't just don't go to church. Don't go to synagogue. What's the big deal? That's the problem because they don't have that same solicitude for religion. They're going to start picking and choose what is a higher value. And that's actually discrimination. 
Where, where are these singing casinos? I want to go to one of these. It sounds <laughs> Celine Dion <laughs> has a great show in Vegas. So uh, here's a question that probably should go to Roger or Allison. How should the law balance the harm of making believers act against their beliefs with the emotional harm uh, because th such beliefs fundamentally conflict with the self-identity of others? Okay, so the question of what if somebody's belief is offensive to somebody else? That's something that is gonna be inevitable in a pluralistic society. So we have to have space for everybody. You could have controversial beliefs. And in fact, the First Amendment and RIFRA and the other laws are precisely designed to protect the most unpopular beliefs. If your beliefs are popular, you don't really need as much protection. So that's the answer to that. Everybody has an equal shot. And if there is offense, hopefully we could be civilized in how we treat each other. However, as Greg was saying earlier, that it's it's about enforcement of civility. I'm paraphrasing Greg, forgive me, but um, our civil rights <laughs> laws are not about civility and enforcement of civility. It's a very blunt instrument. There, there has to be room for people to express and live out their faiths. And we see this in other civil rights laws as well. I mentioned it in the ADA. Um, it's part and parcel of a pluralistic society. We make room for each other. And one final point, it's not, especially on the sexual orientation, gender identity. It's not about saying you can't treat in healthcare a person of a particular identity because a person of religious beliefs will say no. A, that's offensive to people of religious belief. They don't do that. They don't say, I'm not gonna fix your broken bone because of your identity. It's about particular procedures, whether it's sex reassignment in minors or abortion, that's the issues forcing nurses to perform abortions. That's where the fight is, not these hypotheticals. These are the real ones, real cases that in fact, Becerra was on the other side of when I was at HHS and he's now the one in power. And just just to underscore uh, something that Roger uh, has said, I think we've we've all uh, expressed. Um, I think if there's one thing all of us would agree on. It's that the Supreme Court's uh, establishment free exercise jurisprudence uh, leaves a lot uh, to be to be desired. I think if there's one thing that's certain in the Supreme Court's jurisprudence in this area, it's that mere mere, mere offense. Um, cannot cannot be the basis of depriving someone um, of the exercise of their uh, religious liberty rights. Does Mr. Mack or does uh, Dan or Greg, does either of you have an opinion about uh, Canada having defined misgendering as a hate crime? I, that's a question from the audience. I think it's sort of interesting uh, uh, no i guess because that you know that law would not survive the american first amendment so um i mean i i tend to not you know i think the first amendment prohibits you know that sort of thing criminalizing and i think it's generally a good idea that 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 sort of um you know racial slurs as awful as they are are not um criminalized um so yeah i don't really think it's what that about, is relevant to American law. What about two hundred fifty thousand dollar fine, like New York has in employment? Well, I think, and this is—I mean, I think the employ. You know, it's it goes back to, you know, a ban on race discrimination is is no is not really worth much if uh, the employer can hires an African American but subjects them to racial slurs all day. So I think when you're talking about employment, you're a different thing. You know, someone is free to go on the street corner and yell and scream about how Greg Lipper is, supports Sharia law, but if they deny me a marriage license because my parents are interfaith, um, that's a whole different story. And I think that's really, it, it's sort of trying to reconcile people's different beliefs in different contexts in a way that allows everyone to express their views, but also allows a diverse country to sort of participate in society, receive services, receive the necessary care, um, and recognize everyone's religious diversity. So I think you're a fundamental supporter of federalism and subsidiarity, Greg, is that right? <laughs> uh, it, it, it depends. <laughs> okay, well, I think I'm under orders that we conclude the panel at uh, 3.30, so we're within a minute of that, and I wanna thank all of our panelists uh, for extraordinarily interesting uh, presentations and the goodwill of all of you in the face of some very uh, 
challenging and, and highly debated issues. I reiterate for the audience, the CLE passcode. I'm obliged to remind you, thanks very much to our host, Air Meet, uh, which uh, provided the webinar technology here. AirMeet offers us a great opportunity to meet up with old friends or meet new ones in our lounge. Please join us in the lounge to network with other participants or ask questions of some of our panelists. Uh, to join the lounge, uh, you will see an alert in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Click on the alert to move to the lounge and then click on one of the boxes that appears to join a table. You'll need to turn your camera and mic back on when you sit down at a table. Most of our speakers have agreed to join us in the lounge. So I think that is, uh, will help you navigate to the lounge in a minute. I already thank the panelists. I now thank the audience for having tuned tuned in and ask your provocative questions. Um, our reminder is the next conference event, a discussion of state sovereignty or fair weather federalism will begin at 5 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Central, 30 minutes from now. Stand by now for the alert directing you to the lounge. Adios. Thank you.